Hello, everyone. This is Bernadette Smith from Equality Institute. And today I am joined by Jess Pettit, who is a diversity speaker and author. Why don't you introduce yourself, Jess? Sure. Uh, I am a lover of cheese. And uh, after being fired from every job I've ever had doing diversity work, I started my own thing where I do diversity talks, education, or consulting work, including all the places that fired me. <laughs> it's nice to be on the outside, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you're an expert, even though I'm still annoying. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me here today for Five Things in 15 Minutes. So Five Things in 15 Minutes is my weekly LinkedIn live show in which I'm joined by a special guest to talk about what I consider to be good news in the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and corporate social responsibility. So every week, I find five stories which inspire me that show off the positive change that is happening in the world, not the negative stuff, but what I consider to be positive and inspiring. I share those stories in my weekly newsletter, which goes out on Saturday mornings. And then we talk about it for 15 minutes on Mondays. If you don't get the Five Things newsletter, it's a really great dose of good vibes. And you can subscribe by going to theequalityinstitute.com slash join. All right, Jess. So last week, I don't know about you. It sounds like you were on the, the road last week doing some work. But last week was kind of a rest week for me. It was kind of slow work-wise. And so I took the time to, to rest. And geez, sometimes, I don't know about you, sometimes it is very hard for me to rest. <laughs> um, but, you know, I knew that my body needed it. So one of the things I did was watch some documentaries because I, I can really nerd out on documentaries. And I watched a few that specifically addressed mental health. And then, of course, later that week, I learned that the U.S. Tennis Association decided to provide more mental health support Ooh. to the athletes during this week's U.S. Open. So this definitely has got to be a result of Naomi Osaka speaking up about her mental health challenges, Simone Biles, and, and other athletes as well. But the uh, during the U.S. Open, the tournament is now going to make quiet rooms available and provide easy access to mental health as easy as services for a sprained ankle and with no stigma attached. Nice. So I think that's pretty significant and great news. So what do you think about that? Well, I do think it's super positive because I think mental health is something that we don't talk about very much. Um, I know that when I lived in New York City, that was the first time having a therapist was even normalized in my life. And so since then, I have consciously written jokes about conversations with my shrink and I put them in all of my workshops to like normalize that I have a shrink. And of course I have a shrink and you should too. Um, so I think that that's super exciting. I would, I would hope that normalizing the ability to not be consumed um, could accompany a practice of being quiet, right? So then we can alter our expectations of knowing everything and being commod commodification and as a person and allowed to be a quiet person. I think it will not only lead to better actual competitions, but an elevation of humanity and our expectation of each other. I love it. Yeah, I agree. And I think honestly, it's, well, first of all, I hope that it goes far beyond the US Open. And I hope this is something that we start to see gain traction in other tournaments, not only in tennis, but otherwise. Um, but I think that's true. I think that having uh, normalizing this, I can, you're right, kind of normalize the introvert experience as well. Um, different types of mental health um, challenges. And also just the idea of taking rest, like what I did, you know, I think that in our culture, in the, in the, in the American culture, at least, there is a lot of pressure to go, go, go. And mm -hmm. in the documentary I watched last week, The Weight of Gold, about the Olympians who are struggling with mental health issues, including Michael Phelps, it really, uh, it's a fantastic documentary, trigger warning as well content warning for those uh, who might watch it. Um, but it definitely is, um, it, it, those are the types of things that I don't even think about. The level of pressure on these athletes to perform at that level and what happens when things slow down. You know, they lose sponsors, they don't necessarily have a retirement plan and it's, it's really challenging. And I, I'm really thrilled that we're starting to have these conversations because mental health affects every industry. 
Yeah. I, I actually hope it's one of the things that sticks around whenever post COVID happens. I don't know when that's going to be, but airports pre COVID started having quiet spaces or low stimulation spaces. And now due to COVID, they're starting to have outdoor grassy spaces. And I hope like imagine the ability to go outside in an airport while you're in transit to be able to do that in a way that of course aligns with security, but also really honors mental health and quiet space and nature and outside. I think it'd be great. Wow, I didn't even know that was a thing happening. Uh, mm -hmm. What airport, do, have you have you seen that yet? So uh, the quiet rooms or the low stimulation rooms were actually becoming more and more common. Mm -hmm. I typically fly United, so like O'Hare I think had one, um, but I, I don't know what has happened to those spaces now. And then yesterday I was just going through uh, Denver and underneath the like big tents is now a faux grass place with hanging out and you can eat and drink there. It's still outside of security. Um, so I'm curious if more green spaces will be going into airports through security, but still it was lovely to see. Yeah, that is really, that is great to see. Yeah, I definitely have been to the quiet rooms before, but I haven't seen the outdoors, outdoor spaces, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on for sure. Okay, um, next up is a story about Airbnb. So it's not the first time Airbnb has done this, but they are uh, they have a, a program for supporting refugees and other folks who are either surviving natural disasters or whatever happens to be happening in their part of the world or culture. Um, they have a program where hosts can make their spaces, their home or their apartments or whatever be available to these folks, in this case, Afghan refugees, um, and Airbnb covers it. Uh, so hosts can either donate or Airbnb reimburses them. But essentially, it's a way to uh, provide housing, in this case, short-term housing to up to, I think, 220,000 Afghan refugees. So I think it's an incredible program. In this case, it's a partnership with the International Rescue Committee. And uh, it really does make an impact. I love that this, this program exists. Yeah, I think it's amazing. And it's a really great example of corporate social responsibility where corporations get to look at what resources do they have available and what's expendable without really even having to lose profits, right? Like that seems to be the central focus of most corporations, but being able to serve and maintain your own corporate values while serving others is important. Uber, another similar thing is you can donate rides for people to go get vaccinations. Um, so same thing can kind of happen and being able to put those funds towards something that people can mutually agree with is social responsibility. So it's wonderful. Exactly. I love any situation where there's the win, 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 you know, it's, it's good for the company. It's certainly good for PR. It's something that the employees can feel good about. It's something that the host can feel good about. And it's something that obviously is helping in this case, refugees. So um, love that story from Airbnb. Now you're in a similar industry or similar space to me. Do you follow any companies in particular? Because I love paying attention to what Patagonia is doing. And this is another story about corporate social responsibility. Oh, bring it on. All right. So Patagonia is a company that is very fearless when it comes to taking a stand on political issues and on, on environmental issues. And last week, the company Patagonia decided they, they were going to stop providing inventory to a ski resort in Jackson Hole, Wyoming because they found out that the owner of the resort held a fundraiser for some uh, political leaders, such as uh, <laughs> uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I believe. Um, it's, nice. Yeah, uh, and a few others. So, so basically, you know, Patagonia says, you know what, we're not giving you inventory anymore <laughs> because we think that you, we, di we disagree with you. We don't share the same values. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I, I really do think it's interesting that consultants, one of the first things that we do, I'm saving you money, is point out what your organization says its values are and then use that as a rubric to be able to show what is or is not in align with those values. So I, I often call myself, when I'm doing consulting work, the diversity chiropractor, right? But you knew your values beforehand, you could be doing this, but you need this outside point of view. Um, so I think Patagonia doing this is brilliant. Um, I think that the the idea of following your values, um, I think it's uh, Wooster uh, College actually just elevated over 40 professors 
to tenure track because they realized having a two tier education system wasn't in line with their values. So that's a life changing thing for an academic. And I hope more and more people do it. I did not hear about that with Wooster University. That's in Ohio. Um, I'm going to say it's spelled Worcester, right? Which is oh, um, in Massachusetts. outside of Boston because it's Wooster. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah like that's the right. The shot is spelled like Wooster. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I, I know the area. That's interesting. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit more about that story? Because I actually didn't hear it. Well, I think that it just aligns with the story of Patagonia, right? Is that an organization did an, an internal audit and what was really out of whack with their particular values. And then how do you change that? How do you make that right? And so the, this particular university's small liberal arts college realized that by, by supporting this two-tiered stratified faculty uh, system, what it was doing was creating something that was out of alignment. And so it elevated all of its professors to tenure line or tenured uh, professors so that they are paid equitably, both for their research, their service to campus and their uh, actual pedagogy um, equally across all disciplines and experience because that was in line with their values. Wow, this might be the first time a guest has given me a story. But thank you, Jess. I love that story. That's really interesting. That's it's funny because really, really I noticed, cool. oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. No. I was just going to say, I was noticing that each story you mentioned, I have like a similar story. So I was like, I don't know <laughs> what you're expecting. But um, I think in our work, and one of the things that's beautiful about your work is that it's very easy to focus on the negative. And there is a lot of really powerful, amazing change constantly happening. Um, it just doesn't get as many clicks, right? So uh, it should. Right. That's right. That's exactly why I do what I do, because I think that we can be inspired by the positive as well as, you know, I think the negative drives inaction in many cases because it becomes overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? It becomes just like, oh, that's one more thing that's pounding down. But let's look for the light. Right. Walk, right. walk towards the light. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Next article. <laughs> Next <gonna> article <laughs> um, is about Broadway. So Broadway theater owners, union leaders, and essentially a coalition in New York City agreed to a Broadway New Deal. And this New Deal specifically has DEI commitments and guidelines such as inclusion writers and audition materials in Braille. And those are just a few of the things. It's a pretty comprehensive set of commitments. Some of the commitments are a little vague, <laughs> but um, because they are up for individual interpretation, of course, by the, by the theater owners. But I do think that having some sort of comprehensive plan and strategy is great. And, you know, Broadway's pretty diverse already, but probably not so much behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this is a really powerful commitment, even by uh, an industry which we might perceive to already be doing things reasonably well. Right. And it's a really great example of how COVID, the shelter in place, quarantining, screeching halt is a really wonderful tool because so many industries are like, well, how will we ever you can't make incremental change without getting everyone's attention at once. Okay, well, how about this? <laughs> like now we have everyone's attention. So even vague commitments can be actually articulated and very specific things can be articulated across the industry because of the screeching halt. Um, sh shouldn't have to be so dramatic, uh, no pun intended, but using <laughs> that to then build community and elevate the industry standards, I think is the best news. It is because, and it, it requires intention. And these, none of, no DEI advances without a deliberate intention. This work never happens by accident, right? And so sometimes it happens because you're kind of forced into it uh, as a reaction, but intentionally it doesn't happen by accident. And so I love this because by making this public, it's cert it's gonna, definitely going to force accountability. And, and that means that there is going to be real change. Okay, uh, last story for the week is uh, last week was in Women's Equality Day on October 26th, which commemorates the day when white women were given the right to vote in the U.S. And I say that specifically because not all women, only white women, were given that right to vote um, over 100 years ago. 
So this year, Michelob Ultra committed $100 million over five years to women athletes for sponsorships, media coverage, and more, which is significant because it's the one of the largest donations ever invested by a corporation in women's sports. And this will cover naming rights. Of, it actually doesn't. It doesn't actually cover their previous commitment to naming rights of a WNBA stadium, but it is very much focused on sponsorship and investing in women's athletes and, and media promotion of them. So I love this. Yeah, I didn't know anything about this at all. And I think that it's a, a great example when we actually talk about how we talk about progress in a historical way. Uh, we often forget that there's kind of the first round of people that get some kind of benefit who are usually white, educated, upper class, et cetera. And then we just call it a blanket benefit, which then just further marginalizes people. Um, so being able to connect the two, I think is important. Um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that women's sports are generally underserved and underfunded. Even though there is actual legislation that says that has to be equal, we are still really not doing that. Um, and then my little asterisks, like things to think about, is that I think that there are different pockets that are kind of, I'm using air quotes, easy spots for people to feel like, oh, we'll do this and it'll be diverse, right? So women athletes, just athletes in general, well, same thing when politicians talk about urban areas or urban recruitment. Um, there are people of color and all different kinds of diverse identities that are not athletes and that do not live in urban areas. So yay, and be careful you don't slippery slide into yet another kind of biased, easy, low-hanging option. I mean, that's the asterisk with all of these things, right? Yeah. It's easy to take the easy way out. <laughs> um, I would so rather you take the easy way out than not do anything at all. Exactly. And so we've got to start somewhere. And these stories inspire me. I Hopefully they've inspired you and everyone watching today. If you want more inspiring stories, please join us for five things uh, every Saturday morning at the equality institute.com slash join and uh, join us on LinkedIn live every Monday, me and a special guest. Thanks so much for being here, me, being here with me today, Jess. I really appreciate uh, you, you jumping in to join. Absolutely. Thank you for all your work and we all need to be doing it. So thank you so much. All right. Bye everyone. Thanks, Jess. Have a great week.